The Sleepers, Chapter 28, Luck. I yearned for sleep's relief to mend my weariness. Today had been interminable, but the setting sun still held surprise. I started the day with a futile attempt at dialogue with the morning runner on my way to work, but engagement turned hostile. I needed to leave those busy clients alone. Ray then hijacked my morning, relating his encounter with the SSC. I lost my afternoon returning to emotional equilibrium. A final visit from my father broke the fragile peace recovered at my desk. An executive on the floor rattled the otherwise calm nerves of my coworkers, so it was father's custom to give adequate warning. Research was housed in Tower South. Better not to accidentally fumigate the board by keeping us separate, isolated along with accounting and procurement but that meant the upper class had to make an effort to pop in. Notified of the impending visit, the team frantically tidied the place. Once austerely sterile, they resumed work, doing their best to look busy. Given the flustering response, visits from my father had declined to almost nil since I first started at Sleep Free. My father stood in my office, door closed, dressed in another dark suit. In fact, I couldn't recall ever seeing him wear a lab coat. He was all business. Son, I assume you have heard about Ray's exchange with the SSC? Apparently, no one pretended that the firewall between Ray's department and mine would be leak-free. Yes, he spoke to me this morning. Did he mention his new job? No word. Is that why you came? His visits had become so sparse, I was certain this was significant. The whole team thought the same, trying to look busy while hovering nearby, hoping to decipher mumbles through my office walls. Yes, I came to warn you. I sighed, prepared for the worst. How could he still think to protect me? Tomorrow morning we will announce Ray as the new head over drug development. He gauged my reaction with those penetrating eyes, obviously expecting the worst. I nonchalantly nodded acceptance. Okay, well, that makes sense. My voice signaled no tension. The morning fiasco with Ray had drained most of my reactionary impulses. So my father had come at the right time. I thought you would be more upset, he probed, perplexed. I know that Ray's success sometimes makes you angry. That was years ago, Dad. Ray did well in frontier science. I hope that will continue here. Besides, he's destined to be the president. I might as well get used to him in charge. My cool confidence settled my father and he departed with few words. The team shuffled to appear busy as he made his way out. He paused to pop into one intern's cube, I think his name was Brian, to quiz him on his research. That rattled the poor kid. John Jr.'s visit was a courtesy, but also an early warning to prevent a public outburst. Obviously, I was upset, but I wasn't going to prove my father right with another outburst today. I was jealous of Ray's promotion and dreaded him as my double boss. Yet I knew that Ray was finally where I wanted him, at the helm of my group. We could move on from his failure at sleep substitution and create my vision of lucid dreamers. At home that evening, I continued to ponder Ray's meeting with the SSC and the implications of his management. Between dinner and second sleep, Ray called me. Impulse said ignore it. Either he was calling to apologize, which I did not want to hear, or he was calling to boast of his new position, which I also did not want to hear. Ultimately, I settled on answering. I had no desire to listen to one of his long messages rivaling a filibuster. No one possessed a better talent at leaving too long of a message. Hi, John. This is Ray. What's going on? I asked directly, hoping to minimize any chit-chat. Um, can you come over right now? I'd like to talk. That was even stranger than Ray calling me. Ray, it's late, and some of us don't have a sleeper, and I really don't want to rehash our earlier exchange. I guessed he meant to apologize or seek reconciliation. Huh? He grunted in question, having already forgotten the morning's discussion. No, this isn't about the morning. I need to talk to someone about Gabby, and I think you're the only person I can call. Stunned by the topic, I agreed to come. Times were strange for Ray if I was his only friend to call. Okay, give me thirty minutes and I'll be over. Then half-joking, I added, But I can't guarantee the best sleep for you tomorrow. He at last perceived my sarcasm and offered me the sleep day off. I'll use a replacement. It's worth it to me to talk to you. I headed over to Ray's, curious to find out about Gabby. In the excitement of his research, I had forgotten his plans to propose after D.C. 
I had even forgotten about Gabby. The Matson butler opened the door and directed me to the kitchen. Perched at the spacious granite island, Ray leaned his elbows onto the counter, his face hidden behind a crinkled copy of Hamlet. They all die, you know, I laughed as I wondered how many clients read Shakespeare at this hour. He lowered the weighty book to the granite, as if two mountains were meeting. Yes, they sure do. Poor Ophelia. Poor Hamlet. Trading iambic pentameter for caloric guilt, Ray picked up a spoon resting in a nearby dirty bowl. Washington, D.C. changed my perspective. I'm a company man now, started Ray. It was as if we were jumping into his mind halfway through a meaningful conversation. He proceeded to dish up a very healthy portion of ice cream from an open carton near the bowl. The island was so massive, his discarded book and the ice cream tragedy were lost in the dance of speckled minerals. I teased, Most of our rich acquaintances celebrate with Chardonnay or something similar, but I've heard of ice cream rituals too. I was interested, but he was about to eat a lot of ice cream, and I wasn't sure this was the first serving. As if waking from a dream, Ray looked up to ask, Oh, do you want some? No thanks, I don't eat after bedtime. He resumed the dream state, missing my vain attempt at humor. Moving spoonful after spoonful of the time-tested plebeian cure-all to his mouth. The confrontation with the SSC was just the beginning. I foresaw my future. I would go back many times as sleep-free spokesperson. The thought excited me. The confidence of my father empowered me. I finally see that I will be president someday. And for the first time, I really want it. Finding this new confidence a welcome respite from the typical Ray, I listened without further interruption. I actually smiled, enjoying this new Ray, even if he seemed entirely too invested in that ice cream. I went to Gabby's infused with enthusiasm, eager to change the world with her at my side. I dreamed of a sleep revolution, a new era in borrowed rest, a way to balance society and share sleep with all. Your rebuke and my father's praise inspired me to fight the SSC again, even if it's a long war. I only had to nod to indicate listening. The trip meant more to him than I had realized. Some portion of my venting had penetrated his dense perception, but the ice cream continued. We had reservations at the nicest restaurant. I was ready for marriage and planned to let her know. She was a little quieter than normal, but I just thought she wanted to hear about my trip. So I told her everything about D.C., how great it felt to be a Matson, and how I felt hearing about my promotion and my father's blessing. And, I finally interrupted, engaged enough to demand we jump to the outcome. I stood, propping my body weight against the island. What must be coming required no Chinese food distraction. Ray shook his head in agonizing unbelief and lowered the spoon. Well... Apparently I forgot to call or message her the last two days. I grimaced, knowing just enough of women to realize that was a big mistake. She waited for me to finish my story before the emotion burst. He then mimicked her voice. You never called. You care more about your work than me. You've been ignoring me. You're so obsessed with your special project, you barely have time for us anymore. I tried to argue with her, and I denied every accusation, but she was right. My work was so important, I had succeeded at the expense of our time together. In fact, she had a lot to say about my use of time. He nodded with wide eyes and then resumed her voice. What's the point of being a client if you don't have enough time for your girlfriend? There must be a free hour somewhere in those 23 hours for me. My gritting teeth confirmed to Ray that he really had screwed up. I knew he cared about his project, but hadn't realized how much he'd neglected Gappy. Probably about time someone chastised him besides me. She was so upset, John. Pained eyes locked with mine. I had never seen her so miserable. She sucked the life right out of me. For some reason she believed I came to break up with her. But it was the opposite. In talking to her tonight, and even before D.C., I had been so self-absorbed in my future and the new era for Sleep Free, she thought I was building up for the breakup. She thought I couldn't claim my inheritance with a lowly peon.
those were her words, not mine, that I would need an equal heiress. I felt pity for him. He loved Gabby and had been happy. After years of conversations in which I felt no interest, here was suspense at last. Well, did you fix everything? Did you still propose? He shook his head like a big idiot. No, it only got worse. Reaching for the bar stool, I gave up standing at last and let out a long groan. She said she missed the old Ray, the Ray that didn't like sleep free. She said we should just run away, take my inheritance, and go live a new life. Run an orphanage, do philanthropy of some sort, start an art studio, or just move to China and eat all the Chinese food we could handle. He laughed mirthlessly. As much as I needed Ray with me, the offer was tantalizing. That doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, if only I hadn't overreacted. In the middle of the restaurant, never going back there, by the way, I said this was her twisted little plan all along. Make me give up on my dreams, steal my inheritance, and run away from everything I cared about. Even that twisted part of me that relished in Ray's misery could not joy in this conversation. He'd gone too far and knew it. I was speechless. She cried. She had every right to. And from the tears she choked up her last words to me, saying, I never wanted your money, only your love. I offered all those choices because those were your dreams. I thought you hated Sleep Free. Go ahead and stay with your hate, you jerk. I shifted awkwardly at the island, tempted to even grab my own ice cream after all for this soap opera. The redhead was full of fire. He sunk, completely broken. Gabby then just stormed off, tears and rage swirling around her. I should have stopped her there, run after her, fixed it all, but I just yelled out that she was wrong. Two years of courting ruined. For the first time ever, the breakup was his fault. Neither Shakespearean solace nor emulsified confection could erase Ray's swelling guilt. Life was finally, unequivocally, his doing. His rock had found its home, and like the hand of God, he plucked it from the sinking waters. Why'd I do it, John? What came over me that I would give up on the one girl who actually loved me? He asked rhetorically. She even said it. She meant it. He perked up with desperate remorse, making eye contact again as if in plea. I could still return, make amends, and apologize for my bout of insanity? When Samantha ruined us, I had thought it best for Ray, believing he would need an equally soft person. But perhaps I was wrong. Now his life was in my hands. To play God, or stand back and let fate happen. I needed Ray at sleep free. Philanthropy or art might just be too tempting. I'd have to freeze the lake, or lose the rock. Ray, I responded with unheralded sagacity. You could return... But you won't. Words spoken are manifestations of thought, even if still unthought. Once spoken, you grant them life. You can't return to Gabby. Physicists meddling in psychology would well have predicted Ray had found his human match. Game over. All skips pointed to Gabby. Momentum and position fixed destiny on her. She possessed temperate charm and appeal compared to Samantha, she was jealous and tender, unlike so many predecessors. She had no care for his power, only his heart. And she chose to love or ignore Ray's weaknesses, a skill no one had before demonstrated. And now she was gone, and we couldn't have her back. Ray humbly acquiesced, too worn to fight. You're right. It's over. I was the monster, but I have a new purpose. I've made my choice, and for once I must stick by it. Thanks, John, for coming over tonight. I nodded, said goodbye, and left Ray with his thoughts and a new tub of ice cream. Like the unorthodox Nelson at Trafalgar, I had turned my bow and obliterated his line. If Samantha broke Ray's heart, Gabby broke his spirit. Women had always pricked his heart and brought tears. When Ray caused the same pain in another, 
especially the girl right for him, the girl so clearly right for him, it poisoned his soul. His quintessential eagerness to wipe the tears and resaddle was absent. He left the dating world. Work was his attractive alternative. Healing needed time, and love would have to come by miracle or brute, perhaps even manipulative, force. The breakup with Gabby proved to me that luck was a conserved quantity. Ray's failure with both her and the SSC underpinned my faith that fate had trapped us in a closed system. His loss was my gain. God may not play dice, but double sixes ultimately bring snake eyes. My moment of pity at the Matson Mansion vanished. With parallel precision, my triumph was born of Ray's failure. First the girl, then the discovery. It was my turn to celebrate in both arenas. Gloom shrouded our lunches after Gabby's departure. Every new love interest had been a recharge to Ray's mental state. Now he wallowed in misery, unwilling to again enter the battlefield. Out of duty to his despondency, he even skipped the annual Sleep Free Incorporated gala. Our roles continued to evolve. I attended that evening to appease my father, while Ray disappointed his own by not attending. So it was that I met Jane, and everything changed.